I would like to conclude this class with something that I hope will be very, very practical for you. And we will spend a little bit of time in talking about marketing and particularly about how to market yourself. We often think about marketing a product, but I think that we also need to market ourselves. But before we get into that, I would like to do one more thing in terms of financial management from yesterday, all right? One of the things that we spent some time on is learning how to price items that would be in a cafeteria or price our services so that we are certain that we are earning enough so that we don't lose money on every transaction. One of the things that is important as we look at the prices that we charge for an item is related to the overall profitability of a product. So I'm going to go back to my X and Y graph and we're going to look at some relationships between not only um, the cost of something, but its popularity. I can try to do something about that. Um, I'll just make it smaller. That is better, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the x-axis has to do with the popularity of a food item. And the other dimension is profit. And so as we look at these, we'll look at it in terms of the four quadrants. So if we have something that is in this quadrant, low profit and not popular at all, is that something that we're going to want to keep on our menu? That would we would talk about as being a question mark or a puzzle. We don't understand why individuals, first of all, don't like the food and why we're not making a very much of a profit on that food. The other option that we have on this is not very popular, but we're making a lot of money on it. So there's a lot of profitability in that menu item. And so this one is going to be something that is we're going to want to, to market a little bit more. We want to promote it because it um, is high profit, but low popularity. That may be an indication we need to change the recipe a little bit. Is there something about that recipe that we don't, that our customers don't like? This is where I would go to a, um, a survey or to bring people together in a, um, in a committee and serve the food to them and, and really ask them to evaluate and tell me honestly what is wrong with this menu item. Because what we're wanting to do is to increase our profitability as an organization. And um, as a result of that, we're going to go to this focus group to help us to do that. Now, there's this one down here in this quadrant. Not very profitable, but it's really popular. What would you do if you were in that situation? If you had in your restaurant a very popular food item, but you just weren't making any money on it. So Dr. Dan is going to increase the price of what we're charging for it. 
that is the approach that we would take in this situation. Um, one of the things that I would like to know about is how price sensitive are my customers? If they are sensitive to price, that says that as the price goes up, they're not going to buy it anymore. It's just, but if it is something that they've just got to have, they must have it, they will pay any price for it. So what we may want to do is to spend some time in marketing this product so that um, it's already popular, but as we increase the price, we can um, get more money and get more sales of it from it. There's another way in which we can increase the price without changing the price that's on the menu. What would that be? How can we increase the price of a food item but not change the price on the menu? Is that possible? Isn't that, you can't do that, huh? You're not going to allow me to do that. Oh. It's popular. Excellent idea. I love that. There's yet another way. Very simple, very easy. Reduce the portion size. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that is going to be, but I like your idea better to, to bundle it together with another product and sell it as a combined product. I think that has, so what you're doing in that situation is really increasing your overall profit because you're putting other things in there that hopefully are going to be as, as acceptable, as popular as this, as this item is, so that you can increase the, um, your profit, profitability. What I might suggest is that we would look at them both together, that we bundle it and reduce the portion size. And so that um, we have everything there together. All right, we have one additional item or location on this graph, and that is up in this area. This is our star. This is, we're going to promote this, we're going to keep this selling because it is a very popular food item and it is very profitable. And so we want as much sales from that as absolutely possible. And as we get new customers, we may want to introduce them to this in terms of a small portion size as, a, as an appetizer or some other way in which we can just get them to taste it. And if they would just taste it, we've got them hooked. Yep. So that is good. So economics plays a very important role in our profitability in terms of the sensitivity that our customers have in terms of their willingness to pay a, a fair price, hopefully, but a price that is going to result in a profit for us. And I think that that is going to be important. Are there any questions about this? So there are four quadrants on this and looking at popularity and looking at profitability. And I think that one of the areas that we need to really look at is certainly the star. Probably what I would recommend for this lower quadrant, that's the puzzle or the question mark, that's probably something that I need to get off my menu, not serve it anymore and allow other menu items to come on that may be more popular and more um, profitable, 
more profitable for us. Okay? Now we are going to change and we're going to look at marketing. I love this picture. <laughs> so the, the bottom line of marketing. Have any of you had a course in marketing? No. No one. I have a long time ago, and it was an awful class. I just did not like it. It was, it was just not... Um, a class that I was interested in, I guess. But as I have matured and as I've gotten old, marketing is really something that we need to, to be involved in. One of the questions that I think that we need to begin by looking at is, what is the role of marketing in the entire operation of, of, the, of a business? We were talking about a business yesterday in terms of financial management. How does marketing fit into that whole process? One of the things that is important, I believe, in the business process is that we sell our products. If we are interested in nutrition, as an example, that's going to be our product. Is, pro is this a product that we can put on the wall or on a shelf on the wall? No, it's something that we deliver personally to our customer. And so that makes this whole process of marketing much more difficult. It makes this whole process of nutrition much more difficult because we have to provide that service at the point at which the customer is ready for it. Not when it's convenient for us, but when it's convenient for the customer. So that's one of the issues that we've got to look at. But in terms of marketing, maybe we should come up with a better word than marketing, something that we can maybe all understand. And the word that comes to my mind is promotion. How can we promote our service, our product, if you please, but I think that there's something else that we need to market, and that is ourselves. How can we be in that position where people, when they want to have nutrition information, they're going to think of you rather than a competitor? And I think that that's what we need to have, is this ability to promote not only what we do, but to promote ourselves as being an individual that is credible, who is knowledgeable, and gives correct information. So you're not going to get incorrect information from services that you provide. But we still haven't answered this question. How does marketing or promotion be an integral part of the business process? Remember yesterday when we were talking about budgeting, one of the first things that we budgeted for was for income. That is where I'm focused on. I want income. And so income is going to come from services that we provide to our clients, to our customers. And so whatever we're going to do to promote our activities to promote our profession is going to result in an increased productivity, increased income then for us in our operation. And so marketing, promotion, is going to involve almost everything that we do as we um, are involved in volunteer work 
as something that I encourage my students to get involved with, is to become known in the community and in the region so that when individuals need a speaker, I'm willing to go. And so what I'm doing then is promoting or marketing myself as a nutrition expert. And as a result of that, people say, oh, I have really benefited from what you have told me. And as a result of that, you know, I'm going to make some changes in my life. I'm going to change maybe my lifestyle and incorporate things that you have told me. And as a result, that individual is going to tell another individual and it's going to tell more and more people. So what's going to happen to your business? It's going to go very, very well. And so what we're wanting to do is to increase that feeling of demand in the organization. Another question. How has technology changed the way that we do our business? Has technology made any difference? Yes. Give me an example, please. <coughs> All right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. How many of you have a website? Very good. How many of you have a blog? Very good. I would like, when I come in June, to see every hand up, okay? Is that something that you can do? Just set up a blog, it's free, it doesn't cost you anything except your time. Can you use that to promote you and your profession? Yes. I don't know of a better way to do it. I mean, you can do it from the privacy of your own home or your dorm room or wherever. But the thing about it is that people get to know you. So you can use that technology to spread information about your profession so that people know about it. And um, with my students this last quarter, we're on a quarter system rather than a semester system. Do you know the difference between a quarter system and a semester system? Quarters are just much faster. <laughs> now we're always running to keep up. But we taught them how to, to make a blog. And we set up a blog so that they could contribute to that. Just telling the world about what nutrition means to them and how it has changed their life, how it's made them more healthy. And as a result of that, um, do you remember Gigi? Yes. Of course. Yes. <laughs> yes. Gigi is the person, the dynamite behind this in our department. And so we have a student um, website with a blog and we have a faculty one. And so um, before I get home, I'm going to write uh, a blog talking about my experiences here. And so you can go to our blog. I'll send you the, the address. I don't remember what it is right now, but I'll send it to you all so that you have that and you can, can take a look at it. And um, I think that that would be a, a fun thing. But technology has changed our life. Things that... Um, 10 years or 15 years ago, we would have not thought of at all. And how we can connect with the world. And that's the one thing I wanted to tell you about Gigi. She has had people literally from all over the world going to her blog and responding to it. So rewarding to her. And um, we're gonna see if we can't get Gigi to come back in June, so. Um, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, maybe you all need to write to her, and uh, I'll send you her email address. But I think it's just J E J E N O V A L at L L U dot E D U. Is that it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if it doesn't go through, it's my fault. 
Is there another way in which technology has changed our life? There are many dietitians who are doing their nutrition counseling on the web, on Skype, or on other kinds where you have face-to-face -face communication. And so you spend quality time with that person, one-on-one. -on -one. And so you're in your office, you're in your home, you may be in your home office, in which you can reach out to people around the world in terms of the kind of work that you do. And you can be paid for that by PayPal and, and credit cards and, and other things that are available. Um, I was at a meeting earlier in early February, and this individual had a, just a little tiny um, square piece that went into his telephone, and he could swipe a credit card through that on his telephone. Blew me away. <laughs> but it's a, technology is going to just continue to dominate our lives, I believe. But what it has done, as what we've been talking about, it establishes communication channels, not only in our community, but around the world. And that, I think, is really, really exciting. And I wish you the very best as you set these up. Because we do need to be in touch with the world. Got another question. Uh, how has the recent economic downturn and, techn and technological improvements changed the opportunities that you will enjoy as a registered dietitian? Or is it going to be just down? I mean, it's, it's no benefit at all. Any thoughts on that? So the economic downturn has resulted in people who hold on to their money. They don't give you as much as what they maybe have because they don't have the money that they once had. So is there anything that we could consider there? Um, let me see if there's an answer here. There's no answer. So we've got to consider that very, very carefully as to what, what, eco what the economy has done for us or has done against us. But I would like to suggest that it really has benefited us because what that means is that individuals may become more concerned about their health so that they don't have to go to the physician. Sorry about that. But <laughs> yeah, I know that. And so um, I think that the physician and the dietitian need to really work together. And um, the economy of of the the relationship is that. If we stay well, we're going to save money in terms of having to pay hospitalization and medication. Yes, exactly. So um, my bottom line in this aspect of it is that no matter what the economic conditions are, you can find something that is going to be beneficial to you. And um, it may take a lot of discussion and and uh, building of ideas, but they are there and they can be used. Okay, trends is one of the things that we're going to talk about. What is the difference between a trend and a fad? Do you have fads? Do you know what that means? Um, I've got to think of something that is going to be neutral. <laughs> um, when I was young, grr, when I was in high school, there was the hula hoop. Do you know what a hula hoop is? Yes. It's the, and yes, exactly. <laughs> and um, 
everybody had to have a hula hoop. Um, Rubik's Cube was another example of a fad. How many of you have your Rubik's Cube with you? No? No? No. 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 It's a fad. It's gone. It's gone. It, it, it peaks and then it's just gone. So that is a fad. Now a trend, on the other hand, is like a fad, but it is more sustainable and is going to last for a long time. Do you want to follow a trend or do you want to follow a fad? A trend is really where we should be. And what are some of the trends that we have today? Are you aware of any of the trends? Okay. And mm -hmm. they uh, they like to have um, um, advice advices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That for, for, the, for changing their lives, not to get to the hospital. Mm -hmm. well. mm -hmm. I, I hope that they that we and uh, all our colleagues will have a lot to do in the future. Mm -hmm. I hope so too. That's my, my dream for you. Yeah. People is fed up with I don't go to the doctor very often. I'm, I'm a very bad boy. <laughs> but um, I have had to go to the cardiologist a fair amount over the last few years. And it's really fun to go. I go to Dr. Gary Frazier. <laughs> Dr. Gary Frazier is a world well known, worldwide known researcher. And um, so when I go see him, he listens to my heart for about 20 seconds or so. And then I spend about 20 minutes with him and we talk about the world. And so it's, it's really nice to be able to, because he's not only my physician, but he's a colleague. And so we just have a good time in talking. You know, he could be in and out in three minutes, but he's not that kind of a physician. But I, I hope that you have a physician that's going to be something like that. But one of the real trends that is happening in this world is an interest in health. And so you're right on in terms of being fed up with the physician. And so what do you do? You try to take some of it into your own hands and changing the, your behavior. What can you do to avoid illness? And I can see in my lifetime that people who were 50 and 60 years old when I was 10 years old, they looked so old. And they looked like, you know, they were going to die just any time. <laughs> but, you know, I found out, you know, that they were 50 years old. And when you get to be 50, um, it's going to be very, 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 very young. You're not going to feel old. But I think that is a result of some of the trends that we're seeing in that People are living a more healthy life, and as a result of that, they are living a longer life without having a lot of the diseases that we had before. <clears throat> um, one of the factors that I think that is important is smoking of cigarettes. Smoking of cigarettes somehow seems to age a person very, very rapidly. And so as a trend of reduced smoking has resulted in people who look younger at even age 70. I have a friend. She is a graduate of our nutrition and dietetics program. She came to us at approximately age 63 as a registered nurse and she spent two years in our nutrition and dietetics program 
And then she went on and did a master's degree. Then she moved back to Alaska from where she had come, where in Alaska she had been a captain of a small ship that would take people out fishing. When she came to us at age 63, she looked as if she were 40. She, came, she graduated from our program in 1988. So that's 22, 24, 24 years. How old is she now? She's well in 12, 60, 70. She's in her late 80s. Yeah, she's 40. Yeah. You are absolutely right. She still looks like she's about 40 years old. And she's almost 90. We'll have to go to Alaska. <laughs> it was a promotion for Alaska. Yeah, that's right. But I think it was her lifestyle. You know, certainly no tobacco and good nutrition. It makes a difference. And so if you can use that in marketing yourself as a, as a result, you know, there's no guarantees in this, but by making these fundamental changes in our lifestyle, it can make a difference. Loma Linda, where I come from, is one of four cities or areas in this world that are known as the Blue Zone. Have you heard, studied about the Blue Zone? We need to do that. That might be a good topic for one of our discussions in June, in talking about the Blue Zone. An, a, um, a researcher, a author, identified places that he had visited that people live no longer than normal. We tend to think of places like um, Hunza. Have you know, do you know that place? A place in, in Pakistan where people live long. They don't live as long as people in Okinawa, as people in um, Sardinia and Loma Linda, California. So the average lifespan of the people in Loma Linda is well over the national average, about 10 years more. And primarily, one of the factors anyway, is good nutrition. And so you don't have to really sell good nutrition in Loma Linda. But one of my favorite stories about this is that we have a retirement home. A retirement home is a place that you can go and live. It's an apartment setting. It's not, there's no health care there. It's just a community of older people. And many times the age in these uh, retirement centers is somewhere in the neighborhood of 72 to 75 or maybe to 80. The average age in this retirement center in Loma Linda is 90 years of age. They have to be able to carry their own tray. They've got to be able to, at, in the community dining room, they've got to be able to clean their apartment. They've got to take care of themselves. And the average age there is 90 and above. There was one lady there that was 103 years old who volunteered to go into the community and to help the old people. <laughs> The old people were people in their 80s and early 90s. They were motivated to live longer. Yeah, right. And so she lived a very active and productive life. She has recently died, but she died of old age and not as a result of any disease. So this is another area in which we can really fit into a trend in terms of longevity and living a longer and more healthy life. Going backwards here, the second one is food. Um, all you have to do is to look at television and you see many programs about how to prepare food. People are interested in food and that's a trend. Now what is your specialty? It's nutrition and food and eating and that sort of thing. Do you have anything to say to the community? Do you have anything to say to the world? in terms of 
how you can use these trends to benefit not only you, but your profession. So that's something that I would like for you to consider. And then the first one is that of marketing yourself. And we've been talking about that kind of around the edges, but I think we need to really get down and say, how can I market myself? And I've given you some ideas already in terms of getting involved in the community, having a blog, having a website where people can go and get information. You're not going to tell them everything you know because then you're just giving it away. What you want to do is to, to pull them in to say, you really need to have this information and I can provide it for you. We've got it. Okay. Now, let's see if there are any other things that are happening. Those are the three. But I have said on several occasions here that I think it's important that you read outside of your profession. Do you remember me saying that? Yes. One of the reasons why I say that is so that we have an idea of what other people are reading and so what is influencing their behavior, what is influencing their decision making, and so we can adapt what we can provide to those individuals with this new and wonderful product that we have developed that is part of our profession. And so I think that is an area that we need to look at. These are some marketing terms that uh, we'll just spend just a few moments in talking about. One is our customers. That's probably the most important thing. A week ago on Monday, we started talking about quality. And we talked about the fact that quality has to do with design specifications. And that design specification comes from our customer. Yes. What does the customer want? In terms of marketing, that's where we go. We go to our customer to find out what they want, and then we provide that service, the highest quality service that we possibly can, to those customers. Another concern that we've not got to be uh, aware of has to do with demographics. You know demographics. You fill out a survey and you've got all of those. What is there in common with the people that you are helping and providing services for? So by knowing who your customers are and what they are, are after, you can then tailor what you are wanting to, what you are doing, to meet the customer's need. So we've got to really understand what our customers want. Consumption communities. These are groups of customers that tend to live in the same community. There may be some influence in that community. Um, for example, the community may be an older community. And so they have similar needs, and so you can go into that community and provide services for them that are tailored just to what they need. Um, if you are marketing a special food item, you're probably not going to cover all of Romania, but you're going to identify those areas that are going to be more intense or more inclined to um, purchase the product that you have. And so that gets us then to our target market, the people that we're going to really want to sell our product to. So we have used these um, really to help us to identify what our target market is going to be. We've talked already a little bit about this. We are providing a service. We don't have a product. A product is something that we can manufacture and put on the shelf. Is a meal a product? Or is a meal a service? Or is it both? Okay, it has um, factors that relate to both of them, but a product typically is going to have a long shelf life. What is the shelf life of a meal? Can you assemble a meal for a patient and put it on the shelf and come back in two weeks and pick it up? No, that's ridiculous. And so we've got to be able to take this product 
and serve it to our customers now because it's a perishable product. And so when we're looking at nutrition, we are a service. And so a service is something that cannot be inventoried. We cannot put it on a shelf. We've got to do it at a time when the customer is ready for it and not when we're ready to deliver it. So we've got to be responsive even more to our customer. Marketing strategies is nothing more than how are we going to get the attention of our consumer? And so often what we see is advertising. Advertising on the computer, advertising on the television, advertising in the newspaper, on signs all the way around. Do you get a feeling like I get that there's just so much information coming at me that I just tune the whole thing out? Just forget about it. So we're dealing with those kinds of people. So we need to be able to, in some way, get through to them, to get through to me. I think my wife has a problem with me in that issue. <laughs> I try not to uh, tune her out, but um, she says that I can't hear, and she's right, but um, other than that, it's a factor of, of there's so much coming that um, I can't deal with it all. And then the marketing mix. This is the real strategy that we're going to use in terms of getting the attention of our customer. Um, there are a number of factors that we're going to look at in just a moment um, having to do with the product um, mix. And um, sorry about that. Let's talk about, we'll come back and talk about the marketing mix. Because what we need to do is to first of all have a marketing plan. And this marketing plan I want to direct to you and telling or illustrating to you how you can develop a marketing plan to market yourself. Okay? First thing is to develop a support for the entire organization. It may be that you are the only person in the organization and that's probably where we're going to start. And so your heart has to be in it and that you're willing to put the effort into uh, developing this marketing plan. You need to write a mission statement. So after writing a mission statement yesterday for our uh, food service, can you write a mission statement for what you want to do? What is going to be your role in providing this service? What, what is it that's going to be special? And each one of you, if you were to write this mission statement, it would come out to be different, I would predict. Because we each have different values, we have different backgrounds, and we have different ways in which we want to provide nutrition service to our customer. And so diversity is a wonderful thing. It's not to be put down. So once you have your mission statement, then you've got to say, what is the product that I'm going to provide? And for us, it's going to be this um, service product where we are helping our customer in some way. It might be a, a weight loss. Um, clinic in which you take people who are overweight, that want to lose weight, who need to lose weight, who want to go from an individual with type 2 diabetes to not having any at all. Um, so a weight loss is going to be an important part of what we're doing in developing a marketing plan. Um, conducting market research. I have an idea if I were doing this, if I were trying to do this, what I would do first of all is to conduct some market research and find out what it is that the customers really want rather than uh, identifying a major product or service and then going to find out what the customers want. Now I can see a reason why it's in this order because the major product or service we could just say it's nutrition. That's the major Service. And now what we need to do is to do the 
um, market research and find out what is it specifically that is needed by our potential customers in terms of nutrition. Is it weight loss? Is it renal disease? Is it diabetes? Is it whatever? Heart disease. So we're going to find out from this market research what our customers want. We're going to set goals and objectives. These goals and objectives are similar to what we did yesterday in terms of what do we want to accomplish in the short term this year compared to what do we want to accomplish next year and what do we want to accomplish in five years. So we've got to outline that as well. Then we need to develop the strategies that we are going to, to use. And this is where we're going to talk about the marketing mix and the strategies that are part of this marketing mix. We're going to develop the action plan, how we're going to actually deliver what we've planned. And then there's always this issue of um, finances. So remember, we were started out talking about trends and fads. Fads will take you down very, very quickly. So you've got to really understand that what you're dealing with is truly a trend and not just a fad. How do you think that you would differentiate between a fad and a trend? We talked about the hula hoop. We talked about Rubik's Cube. What is unique about those two things as compared to nutrition? Think about that for a moment. Just do the same thing with it. I'm sorry? Just do the same thing with it over and over again. Okay. Mm -hmm. You get tired of it? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it does, it's, it's lost its appeal. Mm -hmm. And so, one of the things that I was thinking is that it is a product. It's something that you buy. Whereas these trends that we were talking about in terms of marketing ourselves, food, and health care, those are things that we really don't have to spend a lot of money for. We don't have something that's going to be on our shelf. It's not going to be a Rubik's Cube that we sometimes play with. It's going to be something that comes into our life and is sustainable in terms of not only our lives, but in the lives of our customer. So we've got to evaluate the trends. Um, find out what the environment is like, what the current situation is. Is the population, our potential customers, ready for something like this? We look at our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Find out, is there anyone else who is doing the same thing that we want to? Is there competition? How can we differentiate between what we want to do and what other people are doing so that we are seen to be separate? It's like the picture that I showed you of the African ladies selling potatoes along the road. Mm -hmm. Everybody looks the same. There's no difference. And what we've got to do is to make our product look different. We need to be sensitive as well to the product life cycle. How long is it going to take for that product to mature? How long is it going to be sustained? And then what is going to happen as it gradually declines? Often it's very difficult to know this, but you need to be sensitive to that. So how long is this trend that we have now in terms of health care going to last? Is this something that's going to be sustainable or is it something that will end very quickly? Don't know. I hope it's something that stays and even becomes more, more stringent, more um, encompassing, more involved in what we are doing. Now, this is the slide that I was looking for. <laughs> Sorry about it. Um, Marketing strategies. This has to do with the marketing mix. That's where we were talking about. The marketing mix is these are ways in which we can promote our product. We can promote our product as a product. 
And the example that I was giving you in terms of the goat milk, that's an example of a very unique product. It's not potatoes set along the side of the road. It's something that you've got to perceive as a very important health-giving product. Part of our marketing strategies might be on price. And so yesterday when we were talking about establishing a minimum price and um, you know, wanting to, to reduce the price a little bit beneath the competition is a wonderful strategy in terms of marketing if it is perceived to be a quality service or a quality product. And coming from you, it will be, so no problem. So what you want to do then is to make certain that your customer feels that they're getting a good value, high quality at a really good price. Or our product um, strategy may have to do with place. Where are you going to provide the service? Where are you going to provide the product? So if you go to a football game, and um, in our country, you may not take anything into the, to, to the stadium. No beer, no water, nothing of edible kinds of things. Primarily what they want to do is to protect the people who are selling those products inside the stadium. And what price do they charge for a bottle of water? It takes a month's salary sometimes to, to pay for that. It's just overwhelmingly expensive. But this is part of their strategy to take advantage of you in this location because they know that you need something to drink, they know that you need a beverage, you know a food, and so they charge a very, very high price for it. And then part of our marketing strategy is going to be within that location, how are we going to get the attention of our potential customers? And that is going to be a, a major problem, I think, but we can do it. We can also look in terms of our marketing mix in terms of people. The customers that we need to serve, how are they going to enter in to our decision making? What process are we going to use? Uh, is it going to be a pop-up on the computer that is so obnoxious that no one is going to even pay attention? How can I get rid of that as quickly as I can? Or I'm gonna block it so I don't see any? Physical evidence. What is there about your service or your product that's going to make a real difference in the life of that person? So in terms of a physical difference, it may be, do they indeed have the possibility of a longer life? Do they have the possibility of better health? Not going to the doctor as often, not um, having to spend money on medication. And number eight, how can we make it so that it is personal? We're going to personalize it exactly for you. Yours is different from everybody else. So I need to get to know you. I need to get to know the customers as an individual rather than as a, a faceless individual in the crowd. So that is one of the ways in which we can market ourselves is that we give personal attention rather than looking at um, you as just a number. Sometimes my wife and I talk with, with each other saying, you know, I think that we're invisible. Have you ever felt that you were invisible? That people will walk right by you and they don't even acknowledge the fact that you are there. You walk into a restaurant and the waiter does not see you there. They will walk by many, many times before they stop to see you and to take your order. You're invisible. I'm glad that I'm not the only one that feels that way. <laughs> this has been helpful for me. 
But you can make a difference. You can recognize the uniqueness of that individual and develop a very positive relationship with them. And as a result, you're going to be successful. And that's what my hope is for you, that you will be successful um, and that you will take advantage of every opportunity that you'll have to market yourself. The skills and the knowledge that you have is unique. There are no other people on the face of this earth that is like a dietitian. And the difference that we can make in the lives of people is significant. And I wish you the very best in that. Do you have any questions about anything that we did these last two weeks? <laughs> yeah. So, for those of you who do not have I, my card, I have distributed cards over the last few days, and um, there are some up here. And if there are not enough, um, you still can get my email, and I would be very happy to continue to communicate with you. I look forward to that very, very much. And it's been a real wonderful time being here with you, and I look forward to being back here in June.